So then let's turn to the January 6th, um, the political prisoners, the people that you're now speaking out on behalf of. Why why even do that? I mean, what what is the benefit of, of talking about a group of people when, you know, you're, you're also saying that your own group needs work and needs and needs focus and attention. You need to turn and pivot and think about yourselves. And I agree with that. I think that um, communities should do their in my experience, you know, growing up in a with a bunch of refugees who couldn't speak English, who came here with nothing um, th they relied on each other. I mean, that's how the community grew. That's how the community gained anything at all. I don't think there was anybody helping. I don't remember anybody getting a loan. I remember the family pooling money together and saying, let's buy one business for, you know, and we can run this one business and we're all going to live in one place while we run this one business. And then that business kind of got bigger and better. And then they could take the extra money and then start another business for another one of the siblings. And it kind of went on like that. And that's exactly how the wealth was built in that community. It was internal and they kept together. And the other thing that they did was, I'm talking about the Vietnamese refugee community. The another thing they did was they didn't leave the community. And I, I wonder if that's like an important point. When they started making money, they didn't move out of the out of, out of the community. And the community was dangerous. When I was a kid growing up, we had a lot of home invasions, gunpoint, uh, a lot of crime, a lot of gangs. Like it was a rough neighborhood when I was a kid growing up in Westminster, California. It then, uh, when I was, I, I split my time between my parents, they were divorced, but that's where I would, when I was with my mom. And um, the community was uh, dangerous, but then as the Vietnamese people started getting more money and uh, then they would, they would bring that money back to the community and spend it in their community, they didn't leave and go live in different neighborhoods. It's still a very you know, my family still lives there and it's still a very Vietnamese community. So I do think there is some value in that idea of band together, stick together. But I also think that there's been, unlike, uh, un you know, uh, the Vietnamese community d did not have things happen to it that from historical readings, you know, and, and looking at reality that were done to the black community. I mean, every time the black community did this, they actually band together, tried to build, try to grow. There was then some sort of policy or some sort of thing that came around to crush that, crush that uh, economic uprising. And, you know, that's where then there's this debilitating cycle that happens of every time you rise, somebody comes to crush you because um, they don't want the competition. I mean, elites and establishment and wealth, you know, they don't want wealthy people don't want other people to be wealthy because that means they're not going to be as wealthy right? and they'd have to share the wealth. They don't want to share the pie. So they try to keep it amongst themselves as best as possible. Um, the problem is, though, is that a lot of the people that have had historically, you know, Democrats, the Democrat Party was certainly a very racist, you know, in the past. You don't have to go back very far to get the real racist policies. But there are still I mean, do you feel like the Republican Party has like racism and in, the, in, in this sort of debilitating attitude as well? I believe the whole government has racism in it. I mean, there's evil in the world. There's evil in the government. There's evil in your community. Heck, there might even be evil in our homes. I don't know. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked above all things. Who can know it? There's people who would do things they had no idea they could do. There's people who have done things that others didn't think was possible. And they've done it because it's in us. It lurks in us. So you look at the government. This is why I said... They need to stop overreaching and they need to stop over legislating. In other words, they need to get their knee off our necks. OK. All right. Not, and, and let us live because we've proven we, we can build cities, hospitals, transportation, uh, you know, you name it, uh, economic systems. We've done this already um, and, and, and many times over and to, only to have it, um, you know, destroyed. And, you know, for one reason or another, whether it was politically or if it was culturally. But yeah. this is some this, this is not new. This is not new to our community. So this is why it's like, OK, let's do it again. This is what has made us. This is what you see when you look at the black man and the black woman. That's what you see that. That's what we carry. You see for better or for worse, good, bad and ugly. That's the history that we get. That's why we're so resilient. That's why we're so beautiful. That's why black is beautiful, because we're resilient, you know, and we can we can teach you some things. We can we, yeah. we, we we've seen a thing or two, and so um, you know that that 
you know, it's there's evil everywhere, you know. It, it, so you just got to be aware of that. But why defend this group of people that, um, you know, and I'm just kind of playing devil's advocate a little bit, but why defend a group of people who many of them were really against the Black Lives Matter movement? Many of them thought, you know, they were the ones wearing all Lives Matter shirts saying, um, you know, this is a ridiculous, you're not treated, or they would say things like, um, the only reason why you have more crime or more police in your community is because you commit more crime. So if you don't want to have police around and uh, and having higher rates of police violence, of course, if you've got more cops around, you're going to see more violence from cops. You know, that's just kind of how it goes. If you have fewer cops around, then you're probably going to see less violence from cops. So if you have a community that needs lots of policing because of high crime rates, then you're going to see higher rates of these types of these types of incidents. So their response is, well, then don't commit the crime. I mean, that's that's the issue. Right. I mean, they so rather than thinking like and then now with George Floyd, now everything's coming out with, well, it was all a farce. You know, the whole thing was a farce. So this is the so, you know, so that's what I what I'm wondering is like, where do you find unity? I know you're wanting to build unity. Where do you build unity with a group of people who are not? Um, I mean, do you think they're getting it right? Are they right when they say these things? Or do you think they're not seeing your plight? Like you're willing to see them and you're willing to see their the the oppression that they're dealing with as January 6ers being called terrorists and being prosecuted as such you're willing to see their plight do you feel like they're getting it wrong with your situation it's a very interesting question because here's the thing if i told you some of the things that i've been told and i've heard and emails that i've gotten <laughs> you wouldn't believe it well you might <laughs> but it, you know you know it's it's you know, it's hard to believe, but, um, like what? Oh, I've had to call monkey shit and, you know, black this and black that and, you know, terrorist and, you know, oh, name it. It's, so a lot, a lot of hate, a lot of hate being emailed. And w when did they email this to you? Was this because you were a black lives matter leader or because you're now pro J J sixers? I mean, who are you getting these emails from? Which side? But I was black. That's Black Lives Matter. That's that that all started the hate started pouring in, but but conversely, so did the love. And that's the point I'm trying to make. They don't all feel like that. See? Yeah. Um and that's but did you problem. get the love? But did you get the love from Democrats, people who typically vote Democrat, or did you get the love from Republicans as well? Democrat initially. Now it's yeah. the Republican, which is my point. It's a it's it's a these boxes are created. They're they're fabricated. They're social constructs. It doesn't matter whether you're a man, woman, gay, straight, black, white, socialist, capitalist, Black Lives Matter, Proud Boys. We all got more in common than we don't. And I'm finding now more than I ever knew how much we have in common. And yeah. that's my point. They love the fact that, you know, I'm reaching out. And they are as desperate as a lot of other folks in this country to improve the race relations. I would never know that. I would have never known until I reached out to them that they had no idea how bad black people had it until they experienced what they're experiencing now. And they've heartbroken. They 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 so they're remorseful. They're, you know, um, and because they didn't know. And now they want to spread the message as well. And this is what I'm doing. And and this is how we're gonna bridge the gap. This is where we find the commonality. So because they're not all gonna, they're not all hateful. But it's it's a it's a loud minority. And that's yeah. the ones we're all fighting. Well, you got to get some good, high quality meat in your diet. And Moink is a company that is going to help you do that. Sixty percent of U.S. pork production comes from one company owned by the Chinese. And their hogs are given something called ractopamine, which is banned in 160 countries, including in China. Yet... You find it in your grocery store aisle every day. Well, there's a better way, and I'm going to tell you about Moink. That is Moo plus Oink, which makes Moink. Uh, Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and sustainable wild-caught Alaskan salmon straight to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should because the family farm does it better. 
Now, the Moink difference is a difference you can taste and you can feel good knowing you're helping family farms stay financially independent too. You're going to choose the meat that's delivered in every single box like ribeyes to chicken breasts to pork chops to salmon fillets and much more. Plus, you can cancel it at any time. I personally really like Moink. We have a freezer full of it. It is delicious meat. It really does taste better. It's high quality. But what I really like personally is that this is helping those family farms. We see a lot of corporate farming and the big corporations are coming along and just gobbling up all the family farms. The family farms that are out there, they're barely surviving. Farming is a dying uh, it's a dying industry, and we really can't afford that. I mean, it is our food. We need our food. We got a lot of people to feed. So this is a great way to keep those family farms going. I grew up in a farming family. My great-grandparents were farmers. My grandfather was a farmer. And this is just a great way to keep that tradition going and to keep the high quality going so that you're not relying on corporate junk. So keep American farming going. Sign up at moinkbox.com slash kim. And listeners of this show are going to get free ground beef for a year. So they'll throw in a package of ground beef into every box for one year, and it is the best ground beef that you've ever had. That is one year of that ground beef. And, but that is for a limited time. So go to moinkbox.com. That's M-O-I-N-K box.com. The link is down below. Moinkbox.com slash Kim. And you can uh, get in on that ground beef. 